My father was taught the art of beekeeping by my grandfather, but growing up I wanted nothing to do with that. Then, 1977, springtime, my father looked at me and he goes, grab that chair, sit in front of the hive. And I looked at him and I go, you're crazy, I'm not sitting in the front over there. And he goes, just sit there, I want you to see what's going to happen. The sun was just coming up over the hill, dawn was just breaking. Lo and behold, as soon as that sun hit that hive, they started flying out. Let me tell you, there was the alarm clock going off. And uh, it was gorgeous, it was beautiful. And he goes, they know what to do, they have to work. And that's their job, to work until they die. And uh, I mean, that's what I do. I don't go on vacations, I see it as a waste of time, because I'd rather work with them. And I look at them as my children, which I don't have any children, but I look at them as, I took it upon myself to say, hey, I'm adopting, you know, uh, 27,000 kids right here, so I better be looking out for them. So I've learned from the bee's patience, respect, you know, and um, I guess work till you die. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Ian. Today we're talking about Cornelia Cody's Only in New York, the New York City personal experience narrative. I love this article. For one thing, Cornelia writes with this joy. It's just a delightful article to read. And if you don't, uh, if you just can't for, forget the insights that she has, forget the uh, uh, analysis that she does, you can just live in the article for, for a few minutes, and it's quite enjoyable. The stories that she collects are, um, are, uh, are th they're funny. They're light, for the most part, they are light, uh, and even the ones that aren't uh, particularly light, they are, uh, they've been converted into lightness. So, I mean, this is true everywhere. I mean, perhaps New York is one of those great examples. London is probably a great example. Paris, Moscow. Um, a friend of mine is just about to embark on a similar uh, project in Dhaka and Bangladesh. Mega cities, cities that have these reputations, cities that have you know that sort of personality, almost where we were talking about movies where you know, people say, oh, you know, but, you know, or like Sex in the City, you know, like New York was really a character. Um, Los Angeles, Austin, and you, you can make an argument, it's not, obviously, it's not as metropolitan, but Cape Breton, places with a sense of identity, a sense of uh, the perception that something happens here that can only happen here. Um, and they form these narrative cores. So as we're talking about personal experience narratives, the thing that Cornelia is studying, the thing that she's collecting, is the idea that people deliberately, uh, well, deliberately is not quite the right word, but people develop within their repertoires these stories about being in working through navigating New York. And often, one of the key examples of it is the people who have moved to New York and the moment where they recognize that they have somehow acclimated to this place. Uh, I have personal experience narratives of when I moved to Newfoundland and it wasn't about when I truly felt like a Newfoundlander, because I never did, but the, uh, like the moment where I sort of like grasped that uh, I, had, I had made a good decision, I have those kind of narratives. You probably have something similar, where, um, where you have something, you've developed something in your storehouse of personal experience narratives about a place, about the activities of that place, that um, demonstrates that you basically have the proper attitude. If you, uh, what Sandra Stahl in the personal experience narrative uh, research, uh, which she talks about how like they're, you know, attitude cores and that personal experience narratives are things that um, demonstrate these, these attitudes, these demonstrate. I've had my hands up like this for a very long time. That's sort of peculiar, but I don't know, I got this arm thing going, it's very comfortable. So, uh, but narratives that demonstrate something about 
uh, the worldview that is appropriate. And so when you are either communicating to each other or when you are communicating your experience to someone who has yet to be, uh, and so there's almost a, it's not it's too fancy to call it pedagogical. It's too fancy to talk about like elder and initiate. Uh, all those words are just too laden with import and they're laden with meaning and they do not necessarily do justice to um, the delight and the joyfulness that these narratives tend to enshrine. These are, these are narratives that are told at, at inopportune moments. They're narratives that are told at cocktail parties. They're narratives that are told in the ludic form of talk. They emerge in contexts of small talk uh, and, and the, the humor is in large part uh, a lot of the point of them. They, they are particularly, uh, particularly key. So um, they are, uh, but because they may maintain these narrative cores, the, these sort of attitudinal cores, they become, uh, just like Sandra Stahl's study of personal experience narratives, again, because this is all sort of built upon, or not, not built upon that exclusively, but built upon the idea of looking at these narratives as some kind of uh, way of testing the culture, you can grasp how New Yorkers understand New York by what they consider appropriate stories. What are narrative-worthy events? What are, again, genuine personal experiences? She does allow for the fact that people might be taking jokes and reformatting them as personal experience narratives, so that is a possibility. But for the most part, genuine first-person narratives uh, about life in the city that exemplify something to the point where it is not simply a communication of an event, it evokes, it uh, suggests um, through whatever kind of uh, veneer of reflection that the narrative might contain, uh, a demonstration of having achieved some form of either status in terms of an identity as a true New Yorker or some kind of wisdom or additional wisdom about how to negotiate. So one of the things that's so common in these narr narratives is that they actually foreground these negative characteristics about the, the idea of harassment in public places, about the idea of people being in your business, about the idea of crime, about the idea of the antagonism between um, pedestrians and drivers, and particularly cabs, about the, 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 the problems that might emerge in, in things like the, you know, the buses or the subways, uh, all the things that are particular and distinct to a city. The, um, the, uh, the, the, the sheer anonymity of size, which again isn't, dist isn't unique to New York, but is unique New York. That's, a, that's an acting exercise, you can take that home. But uh, you know, the, the, the sheer anonymity that comes from such a large population uh, that is not distinct, but is manifested, is not unique, but is manifested in a distinct way. Um, the, the, the cosmopolitanism of it, the, the cultures in context, the very context in which quote unquote urban legends emerge, which is about difference and otherness and uh, not necessarily knowing how to, uh, not necessarily knowing how to negotiate a particular situation because your tradition is unprecedented for these sorts of things. So narratives tend, tend to emerge in those kind of contexts. These are narratives that might be like that, might be shocking, uh, but again, have been reframed. They've been reframed as anecdote. They've been reframed as personal experience narrative. They've been reframed as, it's not quite joke, but it suggests an understanding of how jokes work. Um, because it's still meant to be true. Its primary function isn't the re reveal of an inappropriate incongruity. It isn't, does, they don't end in punchlines, but they end in crescendos in the same way that an amusing narrative, narrative would. So um, she makes this point. Uh, they, um, they mark and enact processes of becoming. This, uh, uh, but transplanted New Yorkers, those here from some excess of spirit, and she's quoting... Um, E.B. White, who was the uh, 
He was the editor of The New Yorker for a number of years, but he and he wrote, he's the white from Strunk and White's Elements of Style. But uh, hey, kiddos, you probably know him as the author of Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little and the, uh, the um, uh, I was going to say, what's that third Shiler sister from uh, Hamilton? Um, anyway, the third Shiler sister of that trio, which is uh, the trumpet of the swan. So E.B. White said, but transplanted New Yorker, the, blah, 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 let me start. But transplanted New Yorkers, those here from some excess of, excess of spirit, are particularly attuned to the spectacle of the city, and they become part of it by crafting their experiences into personal narratives that capture its pace and its paradoxes. Their stories initiate newer transplants, imparting street smarts and making sense of the city's chaos and overstimulation. And that is their function, uh, fundamentally, but I do want to sort of change that from a capital F function to a lowercase f function, that uh, they are there primarily as um, builders of conviviality, like so many of our stories are. Uh, they might have that sort of street, you know, passing on of street smarts involved in them, and that's all very well and good. But let's never, uh, let's never remove the idea that there are things that we do for joy, and that there are things that we do for delight, and that there are things that we do for fellow feeling that are equally important than whatever kind of more specific, more almost as it were quantifiable uh, benefit of them being told. We do these things often because they are fun. Um, uh, Moira Marsh talks about that when her studies of practical jokes. Um, we, uh, jokes are fun, and you do not need to come up with any further rationalization for why they exist. You don't need to impart some kind of function. Maybe they have them. Cool. You don't need to, because fun is an end in of itself. And once, once we forget that, we are doomed. We are social scientists. Uh, I'd rather be doomed. But, uh, but there you go. So, but um, whatever sort of, the, again, these sort of negative stereotypes of New York are, they become refrained through narrative. They are told as true. They are affirmed as such. The, again, like personal experience narratives, the protagonist in the narrative is the same as the narrator, and the narrator is employing the first person. Uh, and so you are meant to understand them as co, co, uh, uh, coterminous, as one and the same. Uh, that is, on one hand, uh, very relevant. Uh, on the other hand, it does allow for things like taking someone else's story, readapting it. It allows uh, for things like uh, the idea of the the tall tale, which are you know traditional narratives that are told as first person, and or shaggy dog stories or whatever. That, that they are fundamentally jokes, but they're told as first person. Um, but uh, uh, but you know the, the, that affirmation. And, and even if one can recognize, or one, and if one desires to, to dwell or delve, sorry, um, even if one can recognize that this is probably not actually a true story, it's still something that might fit the uh, sort of the narrative slot, of the, fun the functional slot of why it is being told. And again, when one of those functions is just delight. Um, and so it's like, I'm here for the story. I do not necessarily care about its ontological reality or its purporting to be about specific events that actually happened in time and space, in part because I know that there's already going to be some adjustment because we do that to make our narratives more compelling. And doubly so we do that to make our narratives more compelling when these are narratives that are told within frameworks of joy and frameworks of delight. To really sort of hammer down as testimony, that's a different context, and you want to sort of uh, uh, flip those. So they're told as true and they're affirmed as such. The narrator is a protagonist, sometimes just a witness, because, I mean, they're not necessarily the person who is uh, the, the, the main actor, but they are always present. So uh, uh, there's often a recasting, setting, tableau, 
it, the, the, they are made more dramatic. Again, because that's what we do with stories. And there's typically they build towards a conclusion. We understand that narratives end. We understand that narratives have an arc. And doubly so when we are speaking about narratives that are delightful and artistic as much as they are in uh, pieces of information. And so they deal with intense experiences, the threat to the self, the encounter with the risks, the encounter with other, the encounter with one's own prejudices, no less. There's that wonderful one where the, uh, the white woman who does speak Mandarin uh, and had lived for several years in China, wanted an apartment, understands that in Chinatown, the local community doesn't often rent outside, so had done some kind of she had done some kind of sort of clever switch where a native Chinese speaker friend of hers had arranged for the appointment and they had some kind of clandestine signal about holding you know, particular newspapers. And then she went, saw the guy with the newspaper, and he said, I don't have an apartment. And uh, lo and behold, she argued with him in like broken Mandarin for a number of minutes. He argued back in broken Mandarin and said, you just don't want to rent to white people and blah, 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 blah. And then some other Chinese guy shows up with his paper. It's like, uh, are you looking for me? Are you the one who's interested in the apartment? It's like, oh, egg on my face. And after a while, I think the thing to think about in terms of these narratives, in terms of these delightful narratives, uh, is... Uh, is when we start thinking about we're on this sort of fuzzy level. We're on this sort of fuzzy barricade because we typically, again, we, 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 we turn these into narratives that are told as true. But since their primary function isn't informational, after a while, we don't necessarily care about the truthness. We might want them told as if they are true. We might want to participate in the aesthetics of a performance of someone telling a true story, indicating throughout, affirming, reaffirming, saying things like, swear to God, or you won't believe, or if I weren't there, I wouldn't have believed it myself, constantly hammering down on the idea that this is a true story, and we don't necessarily care whether it is actually a true story or not. Um, so, uh, as I said, they are narratives about place. New York, a specific place, but it is not. Uh, it is not the only example one can one can come th uh, one can come about. If you are from Cape Breton, you probably know people who have moved to Toronto, uh, and eventually they have Toronto stories. You probably have people who who uh, have Fort Mac Fort McMurray stories, but that's kind of a different thing because that's much more for. Um, fraught with economics and occupation and so on, while Toronto had always been sort of pegged as the big city and historically has had this, this position uh, in the Canadian psyche. So there are narratives all over about going, about all over Canada, about going to Toronto and Torontonians, and doubly so first-generation Torontonians, uh, have these narratives in place where they have been subject to the very things that are troublesome about that city, about Toronto, about New York, about Los Angeles, about London. Um, and uh, they are reframed as personal experience narratives. They're reframed as, as uh, triumphant. That might be the best word. I mean, typically they are funny. But one of the things to bear in mind is the text that often isn't even part of it, or the, the, uh, the, the, the a conclusion that isn't necessarily even voiced, but having faced these negative things, having faced this anon anonymizing city, this violent city, this city with crime, this city with uh, cultures that don't always get along with each other, the city with potentially corrupt officials, fill in the blanks. Having experienced that, you have a narrative. You have survived. The subtext is always, I am here to have told it. And so this is a very fun article. This is a light article. But I always want you to bear in mind that when we're talking about personal experience narratives, we are talking about things that happened in the past. 
and the idea that, um, and again, this is mostly for those narratives that are attested to, even if they have been shaped, um, you know, the, the, they are they are often, they, they do have that poignancy of survival, that poignancy of having somehow gone through something along the lines of a hard experience. They are about crossing the liminal. They are about rites of passage. One of the things, as these narratives often talk about, that's when I knew I was a true New Yorker. It's because they have undergone some kind of transformation and they now have this identity, which is in, indicated by now having the appropriate attitude core. I never thought I'd be able to survive here, and then these things happen, these things happen, and now I am fluent with the cultural codes. They don't say I'm fluent with the cultural codes. They don't say I could have died, but I didn't. But by virtue of them being able to tell a story, they are present. They are alive. They are there. And that's an interesting thing, just to bum you out at the end of this. Because when we start talking about the testimony of survivors, we also, by implication, talk about the testimony that we don't get to hear because uh, from the people who didn't survive. So uh, I'm just gonna start really bringing the room down and thinking about other examples, thinking about things like, uh, why don't we just go for the worst possible uh, uh, Holocaust survival narratives and that they are brutal. They have that hint, that tinge of, and yet I am still here, and yet I survive. But the echo is of those narratives that will never be told. Uh, domestic violence narratives, like the work of Elaine Lawless, uh, they are stories of survival. And often they are stories of intense defiance because the survival was not always a given. The escape from those cycles of violence was not always a given. And so when one hears those stories, you recognize that there are stories that, are, that have gone untold or the stories that have yet to be told because there are people still in those cycles of violence. So I bummed you out. I bummed myself out because I wasn't expecting to go in this direction. But it's one of the strange aspects about personal experience narrative that even in something as joyous as the stories that Cornelia collected, uh, even in something as fun and emphasizing fun and emphasizing humor and emphasizing delight and emphasizing all these categories, the thing that is most poignant is that they are about success when success was not guaranteed. They're about survival, they're about adaptation, when survival or adaptation was not necessarily a, a given. And one can advert to the non-presence, the unknown knowns of those who didn't. Bummed you out, bummed myself out. But it's a great article. Um, and that's what I was reading from it. Uh, maybe you won't get so bummed out when you when you read it, hopefully not, uh, but it's wonderful. I have nothing else to say. Um, I do wish you well, as ever. Uh, we've been talking about, let me just make sure I'm looking at the page uh, so I get the title right, only in, New York, only in New York, the New York City Personal Experience Narrative by Cornelia Cody. As ever, my friends, I wish you nothing but the best. Be well, stay safe.